What is going on, guys? Hope everybody is doing well. Ethereum 2.0, big topic. I'm excited for it. I might not sound like it. Uh, it's been a long day. But uh, I saw this article and um, I thought I'd do a video about it. Mainly, uh, this is going over a few different items within Ethereum 2.0 that um, I didn't know about a few of these and I thought I would pass it along to you guys. Um, if you're familiar with Ethereum right now, it is a proof of work chain. Uh, Ethereum is moving to more of a proof of stake model, um, kind of a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. Uh, and then eventually, I imagine uh, removing the proof of work piece um, as proof of stake becomes more and more mature. But um, Ethereum 2.0 is uh, introducing a lot of very cool things. Uh, not only are you going to be able to run your own validator, uh, that will allow you to stake Ethereum, or to say Ether, and uh, make more Ether from it. Um, this will radically increase the transactions per second that Ethereum uh, will be able to process, which will allow a lot of these applications that are being written right now and have been written to run at a much faster speed in order to uh, kind of bring these applications to life. Um, in addition to not only DeFi, but um, like the application that the, the website that wrote this uh, status I am, uh, they've created a instant messaging client that runs on Ethereum. And I can only imagine that something like Ethereum 2.0 will have a, a huge impact for them uh, to be able to send and receive messages um, in a decentralized manner uh, across the Ethereum network. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it and jump around this article um, onto the items that I thought were pretty interesting. Um, number one, it needs 2 million deposited Ether to start. We covered previously how a validator would need to submit 32 Ether to a deposit contract to join, a, to join the staking system in Ethereum 2.0. What isn't as widely known is that we need 65,536 validators for the new chain to start. That's roughly 2 million Ether. That's exactly 64 validators per plan shard in the system. Too little at first. So I was, um, what, what kind of jumped out at me in this um, point was um, I didn't realize that they were starting at 64 validators per shard. Um, and I really haven't jumped into the Ethereum 2.0 white paper uh, too deep. And I wasn't really sure. Uh, I'm sure the shards will grow as it grows. But from what it sounds like, Ethereum 2.0 will be launching with right around 1,024 uh, shards um, that will be able to process um, each shard will be able to process like their its own blockchain. So the throughput will be through the roof, which I thought was pretty interesting. And also um, the 1024 number is pretty interesting, just being that that's like uh, base 64 in computer hardware. The deposit ceremony is planned for DevCon 5 in Osaka, but it's not going to be a ceremony of 2 million Ether moving around at once. That's when it will begin, and we'll have three to four months until enough deposits have been gathered. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be in Osaka. I might have to check this out. Given that it's not recommended non-devs and casual users join the staking system because their Ether would end up locked in a system that's risky and useless, because no transactions are going to be going around for a bit, it may take a while for the full amount of Ether to come in. Once 2 million Ether is collected in the contract to start the genesis of Ethereum 2.0, it'll only happen at UTC midnight on the following day, rather than the moment that the last deposit comes in. This is because uh, they want to make sure that um, all of these deposits get enough confirmations um, so that it has very high security before they go live with the proof of stake um, system. Some other interesting numbers here. Uh, with a target of a 128 validators per committee um, at 1,024 shards, that's 131,000 validators for a minimum optimal security of the network. Uh, the minimum is actually 111, but they uh, but 128 is a rounded number and a little higher than the minimum, so it's the target. It's also another um, classic number in computer hardware kind of RAM. Uh, same with 1,024. So um, there's a bit of a of a callback there. Uh, being that Ethereum is like a giant CPU. That's kind of cool. 
at less than that number of validators, the network progressively degrades by skipping some shards every now and then and slowing things down slightly in order to make sure the 128,000, I'm sorry, 128 committee validator number remains constant. So um, it'll always group them into this. It uh, sounds like it'll always group them into 128 uh, validators per committee uh, to make sure even if it has to slow down and remove, it sounds like it removes shards, it says skip shards. I think it would actually have to re um, kind of pull validators off one shard and into others if it needs to. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Your private key is online, but you can't get hacked. And this is a question that had come up um, people were not happy that their the private key of the validator would be on the server, um, but they found a way around this, uh, at least to keep your 32 staked ether safe. In order to sign, uh, in order to sign attestations and generate blocks, your val uh, your validator must be connected to the internet and must have the private key of the account loaded. It's a common fear that hacking the validator will let the hacker steal all 32 of someone's ether. That's not the case. When you deposit the 32 ether to become a validator, you also send in the information about the exit account and exit shard. This means that no matter what happens, whether you exit the system voluntarily or are kicked out, the money that belongs to you is sent to that specific account designated as withdraw address. This allows you, for example, to have a ledger device in a safe or another account um, where you can basically designate as the account to send the, the funds to um, if you're either voluntarily shut down the node or if you are kicked out because you're doing something wrong, um, your, your, whatever you are owed will end up back in uh, whatever account you specify. So there is no way to um, pull the ether off of the node even if somebody has access to it. Uh, Ethereum 2 slots are six seconds in length, except when they aren't. Because the Genesis time and time in general in Ethereum 2.0 is expressed in Unix timestamps, and those are susceptible to leap seconds, some slots might be five seconds in length and some might be seven seconds in length, despite being hard-coded to six seconds. Ah, modern computing. So um, this is just something that programmers have to deal with and um, a little bit of developer uh <laughs> you know, uh, inside baseball when it comes to development. Uh, now we're going to get into to the penalties. What are the other ones here? A little bit about the hardware. Um, there are two types of penalties for validators. So you have inactivity leaks and slashing. And we'll go over actually what the difference is here. Uh, inactivity leaks happen when your validator node goes offline for 18 days and the beacon chain is not finalizing then your balance will be reduced by up to 60.8% uh, slash in 18 days. I'm trying to process this. Uh, then your balance will be reduced by up to 60.8%. And I'm not sure if that is the balance of what you've made or if that is including the staked amount. Um, it might just be the balance on what you've made. I mean, if you made quite a bit, though, that could be a, a lot. If a validator behaves uh, provably maliciously, then they are slashed by having their balance reduced. Minimum penalty is one ETH, but it goes up linearly uh, in the number of people slashed at the same time as you. So if you, uh, I guess they're trying to target um, people running a bunch of validator nodes um, that might be kind of grouped together, kind of like a pool. Um, they are, they have an idea if this gives them a way of identifying pools, it seems like. Um, so it's not just going to be one ETH, but it'll actually increase. Um, if, so if you're running a pool of these things and you think that you can get away with hacking the system um, by just uh, messing around with one of them, then they that won't be the case, especially if you think that you're going to get away with it. Uh, so here's a clarification on the difference between penalty and slashing. Clarification, penalty and slashing are not synonyms in Ethereum 2.0. A penalty is a negative reward for like going offline. A slashing is a large penalty, which could be um, up to uh, 132 or more than um, one, uh, one Ether of your 32 balance. Um, 
and a forceful exit for validators that provably committed a malicious action, like a double vote. Uh, it's important to note that this serves as a mechanism for distributed beacon nodes because if many validators rely on the same beacon node and that beacon node goes down, taking the validators with it, those validators suffer a much bigger penalty than if they were on their own separate beacon, beacon nodes. That said, being offline won't be as punishing as you might think, as Vitalik puts it himself. You will only suffer large penalties if you are offline at the same time um, than that of one third of other validators are offline. Otherwise, the penalties for being offline will be tiny to the point where you will be net profitable as long as you are online more than 50 to 67% of the time. The incentives are uh, deliberately designed to be forgiving to avoid discouraging amateur setups to promote decentralization. So they want as many people as possible running these validators, um, basically trying to get the best of the proof of work model, but in a proof of stake model. Um, and again, looking at the way that they're talking about the beacon nodes, it really seems like if somebody was running a pool of, um, of these validators, they probably would only be running one or two beacon nodes that these, these things will be pointed to. So, um, that could be a point of failure. So you might, they really are, are pushing towards having uh, a beacon node per validator, um, to avoid, um, some issues. Now we're getting into the hardware. You don't need a supercomputer to run a validator. Running a validator on two, uh, running a validator or two on weak devices like the Nano PC will be possible. However, you will be you will probably not be able to also run a beacon node on it. For the difference between a beacon node and validator, they have this explainer here. Uh, you will be able to stake from a mobile device, but due to mobile devices shutting off long-running connections on sleep, this might interrupt your connectivity to Ethereum and could affect your staking profits. It's not recommended to stake from a mobile device unless you can keep it plugged in and always on, which if you're dealing with like a phone or something, that still might not prevent it from sleeping unless it's um, hacked in some way. In either of the above cases, you'll need an external beacon node to connect to. It's almost certain entities like Infura will provide beacon nodes for validators to connect to, but if you have a stable connection at home, it's recommended you run your own or connect to one that's hosted somewhere but that, but that isn't as popular. So again, they're pushing you towards running your own beacon node um, and um, letting you know that a beacon node can be a central point of failure and cost you Ethereum or Ether. That said, a standard laptop should be okay for up to 10 validators, so don't expect to break the bank over getting the necessary hardware for amateur setups. So one standard laptop would be enough to stake 320 ether, which is quite a bit. So um, you don't need to be going out and getting, um, you know, an enterprise class server or anything. This thing could probably run on, um, like they said, you can get something like an Intel NUC and, and run these things. Uh, kind of goes into A6 here, which is, is kind of useless. Um, talk about how not every slot has a block. Uh, because slots are discrete units of time, six seconds per, it's possible that some slots might not have blocks. That can happen when there was a disagreement between the validators, latency issues in the com committee responsible for creating and attesting the new block, when a validator didn't show up for work and they were supposed to propose a block or any other number of anomalies that cannot be predicted. So while you may be used to 15 second block times from Ethereum 1, the block times in Ethereum 2 might vary anywhere between six and 18 seconds. A skip of more than two slots should not be possible. So this is basically saying that because there might be issues uh, with certain validators running, um, you know, contributing to the network, um, they have kind of error correction built in that will allow it to skip up to two slots so that on the third slot, they will actually hit a validator that they know will be able to process what they're being asked to process. Kind of goes into um, state stores. Don't need to get into that. Um, I'll have a link to this article if you want to check out some of the ones I'm I'm skipping uh, in the description. And then lastly, there is a queuing mechanism keeping the set of validators roughly the same. A queuing mechanism will make sure the mass exit of validators are slowed down. This means that many validators can't leave all at once, kicked or legally exited. This is so that the number of validators 
of the system stays as stable as possible. If many pending exits are detected, then there's time to make staking more appealing and draw some more validators into the system through an automatic increase in the staking return rate, just like in the mining difficulty adjustment under proof of work. This also serves as an incentive against centralized infrastructure. If many validators leave at once, for example, they all connected to one beacon node by Infura, which is hosted on AWS, and that one went down, they all get punished with either penalties for inactivity or long wait times for their exits. So it sounds like this queuing mechanism, um, it, it does help shifting the work and incentivizing nodes to, um, to, to be online because of the, um, the up in the staking return rate. I'm not sure what time they're, because they're talking about time. And I'm, when I think about this stuff, I think about it in, you know, seconds or, or less than a second that these decisions have to be made. Um, so it should be interesting to see how this part um, works out. I think I'm going to look into this a little bit more because I don't fully understand it. But anyway, I will have a link to this in the description. Uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Please share it. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. I appreciate it. That's all I got. Thanks.